talking a little bit about our backgrounds from games. Like what type of game we played and everything like that. We're gonna go free ball with it. You know? So is this more like, hey, what, what what was the big game that got you like wanting to be a gamer or you can talk about that if you want. Or you know, like what type of genre you like best. Like that. Let's see. So who wants to go first? Start with Let's start with you, Glory Sleeper. Age before beauty. Why not? So you're older than us, that's not something you really want to admit. Ah, <laughs> Believe me, I don't like to admit at all. Well, I have to say, probably one of the first video games I've ever started to be generic was uh, Super Mario. It was the first one. Yeah, it was pretty common for yeah. a lot of us. You know, after that, I got into Duck Hunt. I played Duck Hunt more than Super Mario because I hate that. That dog was just so annoying. Uh, I almost, several TVs almost got broken. I was just like, ah, stupid. So, um, Stop tormenting me. Exactly. Guy. One of the fondest games I remember was for, also for the NES, it was this dodgeball game. It was like Super Dodgeball or something. I think it was what you're talking about. Where basically you pick a team and you can go across the world and challenge the different teams. And you like had special moves where you just wind up the dodgeball and throw it at other opponents. And you can like launch them across the stage or whatever like that. And you like real weird faces and stuff. Uh, they remade it for the. Uh, it was so exciting when they when they remade it for the uh, the what was it? Not the DS, but the Game Boy Advance. That was like my favorite game. I think I played that probably just as much as I did as any Pokemon game. <laughs> like just launching folks across the screen, just <sighs> like I remember this one move you had, like you could just wind up, do three backflips in a row, aim someone down, and like spike them up so high they like launch up for like five, ten seconds, and then fall back down, bounce up, and like instant death. Alright, so. And what was your all time favorite genre? Uh, as far as my genre goes, I. Just say Batman. Just say Batman. <laughs> yes, my favorite genre is Batman, because Batman is a genre. He is so epic, he is yes. a genre. Batman is a genre. He's not even a character or anything like that, he's a genre. <laughs> no, uh, I have to say RPGs. I like role play games. Yeah. I, Started getting into role play games a lot in high school, you know. It just, it's just something about the character building and everything like that, and you know, fighting with a party. It just seemed to be like, okay, this is pretty cool. Don't like playing online, but you know, I like having members of parties to control. Yes. yes. Make them do what they want. Yes. So, my puppet. I mean, Andre. Go ahead. First game? It's gonna be Mario. Ah, actually, the first, like, I've been, I've been gaming on and off since I can remember. I think the first thing I ever remember playing was Pac-Man. Uh, when I was friend's house back when we still lived in Florida. Um, and I mean, I lived in Phenomena Islands. Uh, again, Super Mario, but my favorite was Legend of Zelda, the original. But after we moved again, I never got to play that anymore. Um, I got a Nintendo and we got uh, Super Mario Bros. 3. That was fun. Sun and Second Level terrified that really fuck out of me. I lived in a tropical country. I lived in tropical countries and the idea of going to the beach and having the sun die upon me was terrifying. <laughs> um, again, but really, it kind of calmed down after that. Like. I was at that point in time, like, there were RPGs out there, I never really touched those. Um, it was alternating between PC stuff and console stuff. On, like, Nintendos and stuff, you would have, like, Ninja Turtles, Double Dragons, that's, and the Battle Toads, and that, like, and that's why I used to play there, but, like, on the PC, that's where I would have, like, Civilization 2, and Lords of the Realm 2, because, fuck the first one, right? 
Um, but yeah, like that's where I got my strategy, my strategy gaming in. And after a while, I just kind of leaned more towards that because it felt a lot like deeper, more engrossing. Like I always enjoyed taking like my favorite civilization at the time, the Chinese, and just making them curb stump everyone around the planet, like. Like, and that was the like thing for a very long time. Um, after a while, it did kind of just, just keep going. What? <laughs> this man is looking at his now, but everybody not staring. He's just looking at his eyeballs. Um, for a while it did actually die down between moves, and, uh, it picked up again when we hit, um, after we left Massachusetts, actually, I think, Virginia, I got a PlayStation and Final Fantasy VII, and that's, again, it's like, you get the keystones, like, kind of, miles, my keystone milestones, on your, like, well, a lot of early gamers, like, develop the past, it usually starts off with, like, Mario, goes to Zelda, with maybe a couple of ups in there, and then it kind of dies down a whole lot. If, yeah, if you're lucky enough, you get a screen down over Genesis, which I wasn't. You know, you had your Punishers, and you saw the Hedgehog. For me, it was Mario, Zelda, and then Final Fantasy VII. With some, with, some, with some strategy and civilization literally in between those two disparate points. And after that, it was pretty much just RPGs for me. I like the story building, I like the world elements. The fact that Cloud was an emo douchebag asshole the entire time. He actually had a sense of humor, but nobody remembers that. Do you remember? Mm, I don't remember my life. Everything sucks. Mm. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I'm going to bring that up. Uh, I'm about to say the last time. I'm going to bring that up a little bit later. But, go ahead, Brandon. How about you? Well, well, my first one, uh, my stepdad was trying to find a way to connect with me when he was first like being with my mother, and he happened to have a Nintendo, so he put him with Mario Brothers, and that ended up being my first game. And then from there, he started teaching me the Legend of Zelda, like the original, and he happened to have that second one that everyone calls evil. It's you know what? I liked it. Yeah, it's good. On its own, it was pretty good game. Then those two introduced me into basically my encompass all genres where, you know, I like the action, the, the adventure, the RPG, and so, uh, like, my milestones were after, after that, I had, um, what was it, Batman and, uh, Forever. And I had Legend of, uh, no, Secret of Mana. And it wasn't legend yet. Um, that was me and, my, and two of my brothers used to sit down like every other day and just play the hell out of that. Then my next milestone was Spyro transitioning into Final Fantasy VIII. And I'm so legend, sorry. Yeah. Hey, hey, I liked eight. That's because you didn't it. play seven. No, no, I didn't like seven. What? I didn't like it. The material system is better than the. the it is better. System. It is better. No. What? And on top of that, the gun sword is a distinctly inferior design. Hey, come on, hold on. Let them finish. Let them okay, finish. look, I like the story <laughs> behind eight. Now, everybody hated on the magic system, but I exploited the holy hell out of that. And I found a way to master it. And I liked it because for me, it, it was challenging. It was something I really had to work for if I wanted to beat the game. And then after that, I had Legend of Dragoon, Legend of Ligaia. And from then, I was sold on what genre I was pretty much going to play from then on. And then I... What, really? Really? No. <laughs> like, um, leave him alone. I, I started dabbling in online with... Uh, my first online game was Ragnarok Online. Everybody cried because they're like, no, you should be playing EverQuest. And I'm like, what? That was my first one, too. I don't know. Yeah. Well, Ragnarok Online yeah. or EverQuest? Ragnarok Online. Uh, I, I thought EverQuest was pretty, like, at the time, but, like, I'm gonna be honest, I played Ragnarok, like, way, I think I was, like, 16. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to play with a friend of mine. And actually, I think you might have been in part of that group at one point. Uh, you, you were 
Did you play on the peace servers? Or I played the, on the official servers. I played on the free servers, and I and for a little while I played on the official until they switched back to pay to play. Yeah, no, I didn't play. I played ex exclusively on the free server. So you probably didn't play that one. It's possible. I I know that when I finally left that, I, I felt proud of myself because I was the number two player on the entire server. Yeah, I mean, it's not something a lot of people can say, but I mean, if I go back to it now, there's no way I'd be the same player. But hmm. back then, that, that was saying something. Yeah, it's it would be hard now. Have you seen what they've done to it? Mm -hmm. Like, they've added so many new systems. Like, I remember when TK Boy was, like, the big thing where you could spin kick across the field. Mm -hmm. And then going doing the job, fast ups was, like, retarded. You didn't want to do that because you lost all your awesome, like, combat. Yeah, and then you had to like, and then there was always trying to figure out what worked best, how to master your stats. It, it was ridiculous, but it was, it was engrossing all at the same time. Um, then, I, uh, then I started transitioning from then. At that point, I just started collecting games. Like, I, I got into fighters. Um, I, I found that I was really, like, highly adaptable, so fighters was really fun for me. Uh, and he hit me. Still does. <laughs> but uh like I think my biggest like crowning game that I remember so fondly is Digital Devil Saga. It, it's it, what really sold me was the character development. Essentially how it played out is it starts off with, you know, everybody has no emotion whatsoever. Compressing this. Well, this was the last one. Compressing this down. It's a Sane and Power Rangers. That's very cool. Hmm. Okay. Fast fire and that. <laughs> no, no, that's that's just stealing it to its curious form. Ouch. Deny it. Ouch. Deny it. I I kinda can't because they really <laughs> did get into battle and transform. Essentially, the story was, you know, these people live every day trying to fight for their own survival, and all of a sudden, uh, people get hit with a strange light that causes demons to awaken inside of them. So they shift between human form and demon form, and what makes it so devastating for them is that they have to feed their demon form, and um, like, you know, flesh and whatnot, whatever it's craving, or else it will become so insatiable, they'll lose themselves to the demon. Hmm. And so the demon will go on a rampage. The part of Bloodborne, man. Yeah. You gotta feed the beast, man. Got to that, or with Darker Than Black. Where yeah. each of them had a power, and then they had to... But see, the, the, in Darker Than Black, it was more like they had a power, and then they had a, their cost. Yeah. Like, some people had to eat cigarette butts. Or some people had to, like, fold the quarters on, like, 407 pages. It was compulsionary. You could not do it. Like in yeah. and they were double cycle, they they had a choice. They could. They could hold it off for quite some time, but then what would happen is that the cost would build up to a point where they couldn't pay it off and it would just be a crush. Yeah, like there was just one person she had spent like her whole time refusing to eat. And towards the end, after everything she had done to help you, like right after a major fight, it literally exhausted the last of her reserves to the point where she lost herself. And you were literally this person you had just, you know, you went through thick and thin with and whatnot, and she had just saved your life. You now have to turn to kill her. Oh, wow. Yeah. I see what's still working. Yeah, it, it was really like, good. Uh, and it, it was not, it's not one for the later part because there's some fucked up shit in that game. I still prefer Nocturne. I'm not going to lie. I will not deny Nocturne. Nocturne was fun. And I was so not expecting Dante. See, and that's well, that, that's that's spoilers because like freaking like no, the it's on the cover of the game. Well, that's something I wanted. To, uh, something I wanted to bring up with kind of that where you know you're talking about spoilers and everything like that. We, you know, we're all different with our video game. Well, most of us we went to the RPG route, mm -hmm. but what would have happened if we didn't go down that route? Like, you know, when we were talking about our, you know. Or like you know milestone games and everything like that. They shaped us to who we you know want to be. Like, 
what game you can say within those milestones just made you like go that path, or what could have made seven. you go another way? Seven, and if it's not seven, then I would be like I have. Like I have for me. Yeah. Um, if not seven, if not for seven, like if you take a like if I show people my like PC library, there's a lot of strategy. In Mm-hmm. Lots of strategy, like mech strategy, space strategy, medieval strategy. Like I just, I love the idea of building a bunch of guys and like commanding them. Like over the years, RTS has calmed down for me. I don't like it as much because it doesn't. Yeah, like it really No, no, it's not. It's it 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 reduces the impact each individual unit has. Right, like um, like in Starcraft. They encourage people to just build a shit ton of, a uh, build a shit ton of um grunts and just throw them away. You know they don't matter at all. There's some nameless, faceless goat that you're just gonna go in there and throw against that zergling until the zergling from the stress. Why? Because it buys you point five seconds for this guy to get in place. Whereas in like one of my favorites, which is Shogun Total. There are no reinforcements. I love showing you. What you bring in is what you have. And if you fuck up, that's it. Because that means that half your army might end up running away because you misclicked. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, had a lot more value. That means you have to put a lot more importance on individual individual squadrons. That means you couldn't throw them away without consequence. Yeah. Because guess what? You don't have another squad of uh, marines coming up, you know, over that hill to go reinforce. You had nothing, son. And even if you did have something coming your way, like, it would, and the time it would take for them to decimate your army, it, it was like the equivalent of, you know, hey, it's going to take two days for these guys to arrive. We need to hold out. You're dead day one. Hmm. Day two, they arrive. There's nothing but a bloody mess, and these people... You were fighting them on their homeland, so they're already ready to go for the next fight. Well, not only that, they're also they're also entrenched, and they've got superior tactical position. You're wrong. Why? Because you because you were just busy just flinging them at people and nothing proper got done. Yeah, I remember one of the first mm-hmm. major strategies that I feel like was populous. I always thought populous was more of a it was, it was, puzzle. It, it was a puzzle world building kind of thing, but at the same time, you know, be Excuse me, strategic with your civilization because if you fucked up and and uh and gave them access to an area that they weren't ready for, you'd wipe out your entire civilization. Funny thing is, I never like all my milestone games were just that they just they never really influenced me to what I wanted. Like like I would play Double Dragon with my friends, I play like, you know, uh Basketball game, double uh, dribble, my friends, uh, games like that. I played Super Mario Bros. I used to go to my cousin's house all the time. We used to play Sega. Uh, played Sonic at his house and everything like that. Um, Sega CD. He had like all the freaking Sega systems you could dream of. So I used to play all of them with him. I, I think I see it though. Mm-hmm. You used to always play with people, right? Yeah, but like we never say the truth. Like, when growing up, we only had a uh, Nintendo and then probably a Super Nintendo. After that, uh, after our house burned down, we were given a, uh, a Sega Genesis, but we didn't get Sonic. We got this uh, robot building game. Like, I remember that game. Uh, it was basically... You had like a template between like three different robots, and you had to like mix and match their parts, and then you fight with those parts and whatever. You would give extra jumps or extra speed or extra punch or whatever. That sounds also familiar. Yeah, it's probably it's a very popular game. Up, so what from what I heard, but it's like one of the only games that we had at that time, and I would play that like almost every day. You know, I just, just going through more there. Milestones. Yeah, I mean, that game, I mean, I don't know, it just, it yeah. didn't really have that much of, like, a concrete story, so I don't even know why I went into RPGs, I just kind of just gravitated towards them, because, you know, the story It could be the difference between playing by yourself and playing with a group of people, because I know for a fact that when 
after I left, well, after our military news, like, shift away from where the majority of the family I used to hang out was, mm-hmm. I was by myself most of the time, so that's why I did the past the time, so I got into it, because it was like, you go to school, you go to stand school, you come home, you say your highs, you do your homework, they be watching TV. If there's nothing good on TV, you know, there's always civilization on the computer. And you can <laughs> and you can invest like four or five hours in the civilization. And the funny thing is, I've even played that at my cousin's house. Like civilization, I played a little bit of that at my cousin's house. I remember I think I went to what, the Egyptian Empire. That's right. I, I, I didn't have <laughs> the luxury of enjoying a lot of the civilization games. I, I had like Age of Empires, like one through four. Because those were the games that my stepdad used to buy. And he would just, when he was done with one, he'd hand it to me. There, there are actually four, three. Actually, yeah, no, there's a fourth one now. And it, it doesn't call it Age of Empires 4, it's like Age of Empires something. You mean the online thing? That doesn't count. Mm-hmm. Uh, my dad has like all of them. Uh, had, well, had all of them. Well, maybe, I know they released the second one at HD. It, it might have been that. I might have just been mistaken. It. Yeah. But um, I, I know that he had like four of them. But um, I, I like the second one out of all three of them the most. Oh, everybody liked the second one out of all of them the most. I like, I like the third one though. The third one was on Shotgun. Yeah, I, never, I never. That was the one I didn't really play. I don't really play that much. And the only reason I didn't get to play that was because um, at the time my computer just couldn't handle it. It had just got it done with the other virus. You know. But no, uh, another one of my major milestone games that made me realize that I like like summoning type games like digital, like Nocturne and uh, Shin Megami Tensei and stuff like that was when I sat down and played games like Pokemon and Digimon when it first came out. And like, and like I had like, well, I was like shocked because I had the little Gigapet, the Digimon Gigapet. Yeah. And then next thing I know, there's a game based on the, 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 the Gigapet. And I'm just like, I, I've got to play this. It just cuts. You're talking about Digimon World? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I played, I didn't play Digimon World 1. But Digimon World 2 I played. And I thought that was like the funnest game ever, but then I think we I lost it or something. Yeah, I have Digimon World One, Two, Three. Yeah. Digimon World DS, Digimon World Dusk, Digimon World Dawn. I didn't get that far into it, but <laughs> I went into I went into two, and then I lost it. And then like a few years later, I found it again. I was like, okay, I gotta get this game. I didn't have my same save file, so I just started playing it again, and I was just like. Something about it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like it's the same game as it was. Nostalgia. It's, yeah, it's that nostalgia. I think that's the big thing about it. That nostalgia factor is just like not there anymore. And it's just like, I don't know. It was different back then. Right. It was way different. It's like, I can do that with Pokemon, but... I don't know. No, no, no. I can't go below a certain generation of Pokemon anymore. Oh, I could. Unless I'm playing like one I've never touched, like when uh, I <laughs> modify the game to be something else. That's like you want to talk to them because you've got a bunch of those. Yeah, yeah. like for, like if, I, if <laughs> I've like tried the the Pokemon Brown, uh, Pokemon. <laughs> they, Brown. they got this new one called Insurgents, where it's a completely new made like ROM of it. Basically, it's not even not even a ROM of it. It's like completely new made. You're in a different world. Where it's like the enemies, instead of being like these, you know, kind of uh, eco terrorists or whatever, they're like cults that worship each of the uh, major like uh, legendaries. I don't know if they're crazy. I don't know. I don't know. I've seen some do that. I but um, but like the heroes of them actually it's have one of the text. one of the like pixie Pokemon, like Celebi. Mew, Jirachi, you know, all the ones that have a, like, 100 stat base, I mean, all stats. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what one of the heroes has. And I'm just like, this seems really interesting. That I mean, heck, that could even be, like, a playthrough. Yeah, but no, like, my biggest thing when trying to go back for nostalgia value is after playing, like, X and Y, and then I was like, you know what, I'm going to go back and play Red and Blue. (laughs) And I'll tell you right now, 
if none of you have played Red and Blue because you're not like a 90s kid or whatnot, you're going to cry when you get hit with Fire Spin. Because until Red and Blue was done, Fire Spin was the most broken move in the entire world. It really was. Because you get hit once, you're caught, you can't recall the Pokemon, you can't attack, you're stuck in the Fire Spin, and it was a guaranteed five turn fuck up, and on turn five, that Charizard was going to hit you with fucking video Every again. single Fire Pokemon used it. It was just... It was a broken-ass move. If you didn't kill them before they got fire spin off, it was over. Gym runners. Nothing quite like being salty and having a water Pokemon get beaten by fire spin. And the only thing I have to contribute to this is uh, the biggest summoning game I've ever played is called Sacrifice, produced by Shiny. It's a PC game strategy. And... Contra- contrasting to your single trainers with Pokemon, s- Sacrifice was about wizards uh, manipulating souls. I guess that's probably one of the big reasons why I couldn't get into Pokemon, because the scope just seemed too small. It was a kitty. Yeah, because I'm, I'm playing Pokemon. a wizard, and like near the end of the game, I'm rending holes in the ground, summoning twisters. I've got living artillery. Firing shells at dragons overhead, which are like dodging and weaving between the shots, and then one of them gets hit, and they cream and fall out the sky, and then these monstrosities, like deathly monstrosities with hatchets for arms, reach up and start hacking the dragon to bits, and then it's just like, okay, I summon a pink thing, and then it uses bubbles, and I'm just looking at my entire army and the burning battlefield, and I'm just like, I I I, I don't actually need to do anything. I can just go. Hey, hey, they've got fan fiction of like Tyranitar eating Jigglypuffs. I mean, you want that? That's cool. It's not so much yeah, that. Actually. It's just, <laughs> it's just there's no, there's no balance to it. So you have a bunch, you have a swath of people just running around the, the countryside, catching these dumb little animals that just happen to be really, really dangerous, but non-lethal to the, the trainers for some reason, because whatever. And then. Nothing and actually. Actual nothing events. actually serious <laughs> happens. Nothing actually serious happens. Well, okay. There are. There's no violence. No, no, no. There's no. no, no not mean by, by violence. I mean like serious. No, okay, I'm going to get stop serious right violence. A co- a original storyline. Yes, there actually was violence. Like there, we're talking. You would make a Pokemon get ripped in half in the middle of a fight. You. These things were. If the actual, like, if you sit there and take a look at the Pokedex, you can tell. The Pokedex is dark. The Pokedex is yeah. dark. <laughs> here's okay. the thing, and here's the thing, yeah. too. If you were to read, you know, like they say with all things, read the Pokemon Adventures manga. It's, like, very dark for that. And it's more following red than anything. Uh-huh. So, that way you can tell. It's, 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 it's the difference between marshalling up your, like, I can understand if Team Rocket and I, I'm going to hate myself for saying this. Mm-hmm. Team Rocket was like Cerberus in Mass Effect 3, where they actually had a goal, and they were moving towards their goal in an efficient and organized manner. So much so that the local law enforcement could not handle it, and it was an actual credible threat, and then you had to team up with other trainers, and then you formed a party. There was actually a that's where that thing. happened. And that's the thing. In the Pokemon, yeah, in the Pokemon Adventures manga, that happened. It's like Team Rocket. But, but you're okay. talking about stuff that I never ran into. I all know. I had, all I had, honestly, was red, blue, and yellow to work on. I know. Here's the thing. But when you look at it, red, blue, and yellow, Team Rocket is really the only evil organization. Like anything past that, they're just terror. What are you talking like, about? Like terror. You're, you're essentially like, talking about how they portrayed Doctor Wily in the Mega Man cartoons, which is yes, he was a threat. He was, but he was about as much of a threat as Doctor Eggman, which is. Which is at the end of the day not very. Talking about Eggman. But or Eggman? okay, going into Doctor. Well, okay. proper properly Doctor Robotnik. Actually, no. Originally, it was Doctor Robotnik. Eggman is his great grandson. Yeah. Actually, 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 according to the producers, it's actually a, um, a translation error because they didn't know they didn't want to call him Ed, Ed uh, Doctor Eggman, so they replaced it Robotnik since he turned people into Robotnik robots. Frankly, I like Robotnik. I really do. I it's a 
and it just rolls I off the tongue. Know. It just rolls off the tongue. It feels good. And versus Dr. Eggman, and the first time I saw him, I was like, who the fuck's Dr. Eggman? Oh, oh. I just thought of something. Something that brought, like, probably... <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, I hope that wasn't the thought. No, no. There it goes. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, the game that I have to say is probably what made me love RPGs the best. And I played, I discovered this, it's thanks to Tsunami that I discovered this. Dot Hack. I got behind that. That series, that whole, the four first game series. You know that the anime and and the game are interlaced? Yes. Anime, game, manga, novel, game, novel, Okay, if his favorite genre is Batman, his favorite series is Dot Hack. Yes. I do not... I, I don't even talk to this guy about that hack. I have win. to say you I love win. that hack so much. I still say GU is better than the original. I mean, and this is the thing, though. I can agree with that because I love GU. But GU is interlaced. It's connected all together. It's three years after the fact. Yes. And sort of. Well, the three. yeah, it's three years after the final events of that hack. The original dot hack, but it's all interlaced together to where it's pretty much a timeline beginning in, uh, you know, the then 1999 up until I think 2017, 18. You know, the, the what I, I found that series quite fascinating because there was like so much going on plot wise, and it's yeah, the only thing that ever bugged me was that. Their tech is so great, but their cybersecurity is literally the shittiest. Well, the, it is the shittiest cybersecurity. Oh, it kind of reminds me of Sony. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> you don't have to Just go to the side and come chase after us. It's on him, not what? on us. <laughs> just, just, Oof. Andre, just. <laughs> oh. And then just chop off the head. (laughs) 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 I mean, hey, you want to compare things? Yeah, their cybersecurity was bad. It wasn't so much their cybersecurity was the problem. It was the actual cybersecurity was was the issue. They were logged into the system. They got locked into the system, and not only could they not figure out who who caused it, It what, where, or was who, what. I'm saying, if you're thinking about who, uh, if you think about a cyber attack that drops people into a, coma, into a comatose state, you're going to try to figure out the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's freaking three, se- three separate, three separate series at least with different spin off books. They're worse than the Umbrella Corps. But how they, they they've managed to release? Really, look, they've managed to release a product. That, that is purchased and run by millions of people worldwide mm-hmm. and has a nice little habit of randomly sending you comatose. How were they supposed no. to know it was the it was not the main AI? Still, it's it a product a that is a AI product that is that it's a matter. It's a product they produced. I'm not going into the ethics of individual free will or whatever in robotic systems, but it's a product that was manufactured, manufactured, and sold on a world market. Nobody got arrested. It wasn't well, even. Got arrested. Well, From what I saw in little bits and pieces that I read, nobody well, got arrested. Technically, the nobody original was... creator died. Yeah, but I mean, so it's it not a corporation. It's just, thing. it's just staggering. It's like so. This thing has happened not once, not twice, but multiple times. We can say that this particular, this particular <clears throat> syndrome has happened multiple yeah. times. Right, and the way, and the way that rumors spread on the internet, you mean to tell me? That you have a piece of software that's probably is this that is potentially killing people, and everybody's gonna log into it like eh whatever. It's just All right, well, right. well, okay. The story behind that is actually uh, as much. I'm as not. I'm not trying. To, I'm not really targeting the story. I'm targeting the common sense behind using a piece of software that well, could potentially kill you. Hang okay, on. Let's go with the common sense then. Okay. Okay. I'll go with it. Yeah, go with the common okay. sense. Okay. Okay. Go for the common just hang it. The first thing is when they release a product, no one knew. That there was a hidden, uh, there was a hidden and you bug. Can forgive in the them, and you can forgive them for that. Mm-hmm. One. The it's bug, 
is uh, the, when the bug hit, the first person that went down, went down so quietly, no one realized it was a thing. Patient Zero is also a forgivable offense. What I'm talking yeah. about is when it became a full-fledged epidemic. When it became epidemic. a full-fledged epidemic, they had five PI. They had uh, the, uh, the whole police, uh, like, they had the whole P programming team working on it. And the PI were going to be trying to, uh, to trace is the, what they found was the source was a thing called um, the Epitaph of Twilight. And basically they had the PI searching down the background what happened. And you just pointed out the flaw right there. So they had five private investigators and their programming team working on it. That's great from the corporation standpoint, but this is actually that has actually become at that point a civil and probably possibly even a federal matter mm -hmm. because of the scale of it. So where why were they disseminating the product to other sources to analyze, break down, and figure out what the issue was? Here's the thing, though: the epitaph is programmed to the game itself. That the game is based off of the epitaph. So to break down the epitaph, break down that part, you will have to break down the entire game. The game would be destroyed. Did they want to do that? Probably not. Well, they, they ended up making at money. the end of the game. They did. They yeah. destroyed the world. Yeah, they destroyed the world and became. And world. what happened? The why it happened a second time was because another corporation got their hands on the original log and rebuilt the world off of that log, and it happened again. But this time, not on the same scale. But on, uh, but it's still just as bad. Dot had GU. That was even more twisted because they had threw it all uh, out completely. There was no connect, direct connection in any way, shape, or form to the original two games. They re they released it as New World, but it was literally built from the ground up with nothing in it, and somehow. Or I got back into it and along with the epitaphs. Mainly because they were programmed. Most of the epitaph users in GU, they had some connection to the previous the previous uh, games. Games. It's the and virus also, it's the virus they, they altering the functionality of the human brain, turning the humans into potential code virus carriers themselves. Yes. Yeah. That's why the main character of GU was Skip because he was the first one that was sent into a coma by Skip. No, no, the person who plays the Hasebo character was not the first to go. Yes, he was. No, the first he one was. to go by Skate. Do you remember what I said? Was. Remember what I said? I can sit guy. here and argue with this, but we're not going to do that because that'll be no, no, no. Right. I'm serious I, I, here. I would Skaith love to have this argument with you. Skate. Skate. Do you remember that you him? No, but Tsukasa. that was not him. Sukasa was a girl, and yes. Sukasa was okay. Patient Zero. But the him that was the first one data drained by Skate. That was, and the first one data drained by Skate was Kate's character. No, it was not. It was Haseo, who was Sora, who was the assassin, the twin blade. All right, you know what? I'm gonna go pull my games out. And I'm gonna prove it. To I you. will. It's not in the games. It's in Dot Hat Sign. Yeah. At the end of Dot Hat Sign, has uh. Sora makes a sacrifice and becomes like a good guy, and he is data drained. And after he's data drained, the one who data drained him turns into Skate. You're gonna have to pull this up for me. I want to see this. I will show you. I will show you. All right. But um, let's continue past that. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not here all night because I can sit here literally all day. Um. Let's see, Ooh, shit. what's another good game that I would have to say, well, you two know each other longer. Okay. Uh, well, let's see. It's only 19. Okay. Well, let's go ahead, let's go ahead and uh, wrap this up. That was a pretty good discussion. <laughs> um, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Uh, any ending statements for everyone as far as like people First, starting out in the games and everything. Go pick up Shimigami. That's horrible. <laughs> Why would you do that to anybody? This you might as well tell them. You might as well tell them to pick up Persona Four. This is their beginning game. Okay, we're not trying to scare them. Go the game. It depends on what level gamer they are. But the like beginning game. Like, 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 I should be more accurate. What their level of hand eye coordination is and how old they are. 
That is extremely important. If they're a beginning gamer, the, the one thing I have to say is unless you really, really like sports, in which case go with one of the modern consoles, just start off with Nintendo. Just start off with Nintendo. Yeah. Nintendo still makes games which focuses fun. And uh, there's they're they're they, not they, 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 they can be dicks. Things. They they can be dicks. They can be really really big dicks. But at, yeah. but at yeah. the end of the day, um, they still they they make games to make games. They're not making games to be DLC factories. They're not making games to squeeze money out of you. They're making games that are fun that are filled with like you know enjoyable things to do, and and know, they know how to target nostalgia, and they're big dicks. Really? Like table sausages, son. Just, just throw it on the table. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so. This has been Back Room Crew. Uh, this is going to be our new format for a uh, podcast now. We hope that you like it. Remember to uh, comment down below if you like this new format. Uh, subscribe to us and, you know, thumbs up the video. Peace. Peace out. Look at him, look at our control. He's a little producer over there. Uh, yeah. Uh.